Today, we're going to do a deep dive into my new website, leerob.io, that I've recently revamped with a brand new design and updated to use the latest Next.js features. And I want to show you some of the cool things that I built. So I have my code up on the left here and on the right, I have my new site. So I'll just kind of give a quick demo overview of, of what I'm looking at here. And then I can kind of slowly explain things as we step through the code base. So first off, I have a new design that I'm pretty happy about. It's pretty minimal. It's pretty simplistic. I wanted just to strip back everything to a very uh, basic, but sleek design. So I have my homepage here. It is static. Uh, it has some content that's being pulled from Twitter and from GitHub and from my blog views. It has a couple links. And this content right here is actually using ISR. So these numbers will update every, at most, every 60 seconds. And I'll, we'll get into that more in a little bit. Then I have an about page, pretty standard, but again, this is a static page. So really fast to transition between those two pages because Next.js gives you that single page app like feel, even though you're in a multi-page app, it's really fast to transition between those pages, even though they're being rendered from the server. So I've got an about page with some links to some of my socials. I've got a blog that has a link to all my different blog posts. These are using MDX and they're rendered using server components in the app directory with the new app router in Next.js. And they pull the different blog views from Planet scale, my MySQL database, and I use MDX to render some images and code blocks and all sorts of nice things here. I'm using Tailwind for the styling. And then if I go to Guestbook, this is a server rendered page. So we're mixing a bunch of different types of rendering and data fetching strategies here, which we're going to get into. And we have some, some lovely folks here who have left some comments on my site by logging in with GitHub and then leaving a message. And I think I display like the first 50 or so here, uh, which is just fun. It's a little throwback to the the uh, the retro way of the web or the guest books. So, so there's some, you know, there's some nice little touches here that I really like. One is I'm using Framer Motion here on the left for this really sleek transition between the different pages. And actually if I zoom in, let's see how big I can get this without it looking absolutely horrid but of course i have a hover state here but notice that the the background rectangle that is moving between the different active nav links not only does it change position but it also changes the width which is a nice little touch and it's got this spring motion animation on it to make it feel really fluid really natural and we're going to take a look at the code for that as well too uh and answer every question that y'all have. So in my readme, I have a list of all of the different tools I'm using. Of course, I have Next.js, Play to Scale, Next Auth, or now Auth.js. I'm using Vercel, of course, Tailwind CSS, and Vercel Analytics for tracking my page views and, and traffic analytics. Uh, there's still some things that I want to do here as I continue working on the site, but I figured, you know what? I'm just going to ship it and we can <laughs> improve, uh, improve in public. And I'm using PMPM. So let me open up the file explorer here. Where to begin? Let's begin with the config files. So all of our, our dot files are our config files. I'm using TypeScript. This is basically the standard boilerplate TypeScript file that Next.js gives you. I don't have to change anything here, really. Next.js just spits this out for me. And it is set up to use the new plugin, TypeScript plugin, in the app directory with Next.js, which gives you some really helpful um, typing and autocompletes. The only other thing that I've changed in here is that I'm using content layer, which is the tool that allows me to have type safe access to my content, in this instance, my markdown files. Now I have another video on my channel where I interview the creator of content layer. So if you want to learn more about that, go check it out. But it's very neat. I had to add a couple things in here just to make TypeScript aware of the generated files. I actually jump to that next since we're on the topic here. Um, so in my content layer config file, what I'm doing is essentially, if I scroll down just a little bit, I'm defining a source for my content. So I have some markdown files and I want to use them in my application. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. Um, I've 
I've had just vanilla Markdown before. I've had MDX. I've used a CMS. I've used Sanity before. Ultimately, I wanted to use Content Layer again and use MDX again because it's easier for beginners who clone my repository to not have to go set up a CMS. It's nice when you can include a Markdown file directly in the repo and you're already up and running. So what this does is it says, hey, there is a content folder. That's gonna be where all the Markdown files are. We have a blog document. We're gonna use some plugins. So Remark and Rehype, there's a whole ecosystem of plugins to work with Markdown. Uh, we're gonna add some nice things here, like being able to highlight specific words. We're going to auto link headings. And all of this is just using third-party Remark or Rehype libraries. Um, on the actual blog, we get to define what fields we care about. So I have a title, when it's published, the summary, the image, all that good stuff. And I say, they're all gonna be MDX files. And I also put some computed fields. So I don't have to manually write these out. Content layer is gonna generate these for me. So I'm gonna generate a slug. And this is kind of fancy, but fun. I'm going to look through the entire document and I'm gonna do a regex for a static tweet component. And I'm gonna pull out all the IDs for that. Now I'll show you how this works a little bit later, but it's kind of cool. It allows me to embed tweets in my blog post. For example, I have this tweet here and I don't have to use the Twitter uh, iframe that they give you. Um, in, so <laughs> we'll see if I continue to do this because Twitter AVI is adding pricing. We don't know how expensive it'll be just yet. Hopefully it's cheap. Um, we don't really know yet. So that's content layer. Let me pop over to the content folder really quick, which is where this is actually pulling the content from. Inside of your eyes have a bunch of MDX files and all of these MDX files essentially correlate to a specific blog post that's being pulled here on this index. So inside of here, I'm writing Markdown, essentially. I have some metadata at the top of the file. And then in some of these files, I'm able to stitch together not only Markdown as you might've written on GitHub or in other places, I can also use React components. That's the magic of MDX. So I have a callout and I'm using this to render. Um, let me actually pull this up here. Where am I at? Um, this is this callout component here. So just a nice little way to add some special styling on top and add some unique components. Then basically the sky's the limit. You can build whatever you want because you have the power of the full React component. Um, so that is the content folder. We'll get more into this when we talk about the actual rendering of the page. But let's go back to the config files. What else we got here? I have Tailwind. Uh, Tailwind's fantastic. Really the only change I've made here is that I'm now looking at the app directory for files that I want to make aware of my Tailwind classes. I'm using a custom font, which I'll show the code for this. And another small fun thing here that you should know about. I really like this future option in Tailwind, which it only adds hover styles when it's supported. What that means is it strips away all of your hover styles on mobile devices because you can't hover on mobile, you can only tap. So that's a nice little feature um, that Tailwind bakes in. Post CSS is part of Tailwind. I'm using PMPM as we talked about. Um, that's pretty much it on the configuration files other than the Next.js configuration itself. So let's talk about that. Um, first up, I'm gonna be using some images in my application and I'm able to configure them here by saying I wanna use the latest formats like AVIF and WebP. And I'm gonna allow list a specific URL of images to optimize from. In this instance, it is images from Twitter. I am opting into using the app directory, which will be stable soon. I saw someone ask about that. Um, it's getting closer every day. And um, we'll use some of the latest features uh, with the new app router in this video. I have some redirects right now that I'm just hard coding in here that I'm fetching dynamically. I do want to move out of this um, because this is actually fetching all of my redirects that are being evaluated before the rest of my request has been processed. I'd rather do it at the end of the quote unquote routing chain so that when my router in my application is checking for a path, it's if and only if it's checked 
all of the paths that it knows exist, then it goes to the 404s of the redirects. Um, so I'll be making that change in the future. I add some security headers. This is nothing new if you've been following along. I had this on my last site as well, as well too. Um, and I have links in here to all the different security headers, the MDM docs and what they mean. This is just a, a nice to have, not necessarily a must have. Let's now dive into the top most thing in our directory tree here, which is the app directory. So the app directory is new. It was released in Next.js 13. You can call this the app router uh, for, for simplicity's sake. But inside this app directory, everything is a React server component by default. Now, this is great because it helps you send less JavaScript to the client side, and it allows you to co-locate your files, whether they're pages or not pages. And it has much better support for data fetching with async components. All of these things we're going to talk about here. So let's start with the entry point into the app directory, which is the layout. So this layout is our root layout because it is the one highest up in the tree of our application. So let me skip down just a little bit here to the actual render. Um, the default exported component here of our root layout, it accepts some React children, and then it actually renders the HTML tag for our document. So we have an HTML tag. I am saying we're using the English language. I'm adding this font that I'm using this custom font, which is this one right here, uh, Kaize. Very nice, very nice font. Um, we have a body. I have my sidebar component. And the reason this is pulled out into a separate component is because this is a client component. So this client component runs on the client side. It's both pre-rendered on the server, and then it sends JavaScript to the client side so that it can add interactivity similar to the way that Next.js 12, 11, 10, and other frameworks work. So this is kind of how things used to work and how you would um, your mental model would have worked in the past for adding interactive components. The helpful way here for me to think about it is server components are great for fetching data and constructing your DOM. But when you want to add interactivity, that's when you usually pull for a client component. And then I have my main tag, I have my children, and I render the page. Now, this is all using Tailwind, so the styles are all right here. There isn't any other styling that I need to do. If I scroll up a little bit, I'm loading my font using next font. And this is great because it helps me make sure that there's no layout shift when I load my page. So as you can see, no layout shift. In this instance, my font has been cached in the browser, but even if it wasn't cached, it has font display swap to ensure that the font will always show and next font will automatically preload your self-hosted font files. So essentially it has every single optimization possible to make your fonts load fast because not gonna lie, that stuff is tough. Getting your fonts to load perfectly is really hard. So we've tried to put it all into one really easy way of handling this. Now we've got some fun stuff here that some of y'all might have seen on the, the Twitterverse which is the improved support for metadata inside of the app directory. This is effectively like built-in SEO helpers. So rather than having to use the next head API in the pages directory or the uh, intermediary head.js file, for those of you who have explored the app directory a little bit, we have this new support, it's available on Canary now, to define metadata um, either static, like you're seeing here, or dynamic fetched from an API. I have both in my application. We're going to show both. So there's some really cool stuff here. One, I'm defining a template. So the default title is my name. Anything else appends Lee Robinson on the end. So if I go to blog, um, you see in the browser, it's blog, you know, vertical bar Lee Robinson. Uh, I set some robots tags here so that it can be crawled by crawlers and I can um, get all the max SEO juices, um, some Twitter, OG image work, my favicon, and then some search engine verification tags. This makes it really, really easy to handle setting meta and link tags or metadata inside of your application that go in the head of your document. So that's the layout. That's the first thing that gets rendered on the page. 
that renders your shell. The next thing is the actual page. So in this instance, app slash page.tsx, this is my index route or my index page. Nothing will be shown on the screen unless you have a page file, a page special file. So this is the page. Um, I'm gonna, again, start down here, rendering the actual function, and then we can kind of work our way back up. So inside of this home page, you're going to see the first async component. Now, this is, this is actually mind blowing. This is the mic drop. This is the coolest thing in the app directory because it takes advantage of the latest React features being async components and server components. I can just turn my function into an async function and I can just fetch data directly in the function. Now you might be thinking, How, what, how's that possible? It's possible because React is gonna stop and it's gonna say, actually, let's go fetch this stuff. Then we'll produce this HTML and return it from the server. So you don't have to do get static props. You don't have to do get server side props. There's no serialization of the result where you had to do some kind of workarounds. It, it kind of just works. And that's really great because it gives you a ton of flexibility in how you want to fetch data. It doesn't have to be in the page. It can actually be lower down in the tree in components as well too. And there's some other niceties here that we're going to talk about. So what's happening here is I am defining some variables. I am fetching the GitHub stars, the tweets, and my blog post views in parallel using promise.all, um, which is kind of the naive way of doing it. Uh, and then I just have a try catch uh, that I have a uh, just some some basic HTML here, an H1, a paragraph, an image. Um, there's some interesting stuff here that I'm going to talk about. Uh, one, you might be wondering why I have functions for all this stuff. And that's because I have a script that allows me to delete all of my content and scaffold out a brand new app with no personal information. It makes it easy to clone this and get started. I'll demo that later. Um, I have an image and there's a nice thing here. Good to know with the next image component. The next image component helps you use images without having layout shift and automatically optimizing them. But there's this priority prop that is important to know if you're using images that are going to be quote unquote above the fold. So they're going to render uh, in the first thing that you see on the page. If you do that, you want to use the priority prop because it's going to preload that image and make it load as fast as possible. Uh, this image is being imported from a file. Um, and what's cool about this, um, you know, in this instance, it's in, it's in another file here because I have that script I talked about, but this avatar is located in the app directory. I don't have to put it in another directory. I can co-locate it with the rest of my code. Uh, and that's that's pretty cool. I can directly import the image. I can have a blur up placeholder as I'm ready. And that's pretty much that. Then I have some more data here. I have Twitter, GitHub, views, icons, and I have some string templates here, bio, uh, a list of stuff, and that's pretty much it. Uh, one other small thing here, a pattern that I like, this is just personal opinion, but I like putting the SVG icons into a separate file, like this arrow icon here. Um, the SVG, inline SVG, can take up a lot of space in your JSX. So I think it looks a little more clean when you put this uh, in this. I have this components icons file, so I can actually just pull that up. It's, it's just a bunch of icons that I have inline SVGs here that I've kind of optimized using SVGO to get the smallest file size, and then I import them here. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the metadata on this page. As I showed the metadata in the layout, which is for the entire application, I also have page-specific metadata. So these objects get merged together, and the highest priority one wins. For example, I overwrote the title and description here, and in this case, this is for the uh, index route, so it's just going to be Lee Robinson. It's just going to be this description, and I have some, you know, some OG information as well too. Uh, so this essentially extends the base set of metadata that I've defined. Now I also have revalidate, and if you've used ISR before, you've seen this revalidate in a get static props. Um, similar idea here for this page. I want to revalidate it at most every 60 seconds to go fetch new information about my 
tweet or blog or um, GitHub stars count. So on the right here, I have uh, a million something uh, 419 views. If I refresh, you'll see that the ISR kicked in because I've had this I've had this page open for a while. The data was refetched in the background. The static page was swapped out, and the views went up, and the tweets or the stars went up, not the not the tweets. I haven't tweeted since I've been on here. <laughs> um, so that's the metadata, and that's that's pretty much all I have to say on the index route. Uh, I'll pop over to the info file here that I talked about as well too, just so you can see what this looks like. Effectively, all I'm doing is defining my constants for the information that is specific to me, my name, my avatar, uh, my my quick sentence summary of me and my bio, just so that I can import them and use them. And then I have a script that essentially deletes all of this and replaces it with placeholder information when you clone the repository. Okay, so that's the index route. What else do we got here? Well, I mentioned I had this avatar, it's co-located, that's awesome. We already talked about layout and page. Let's talk about the CSS setup, actually. Going back into my layout, I was importing some global CSS, and this is importing the Tailwind base. And then I have a few small additional classes that I've added, mostly to modify the Tailwind topography configuration. Tailwind topography gives me some default styling for how I um, essentially render the content of my blog posts. So it gives me some defaults. And then inside of here, I've overwritten just a couple things. Uh, you can use this apply syntax with Tailwind to directly apply these classes. So I've changed the code, I've changed uh, some images. But all in all, what do I have here? I have like 130 lines of just extra custom styles. Other than that, it is mostly just the stock Tailwind and that's that's effectively all the styling in my application. So that's pretty nice. Uh, I also have an error file, which I'll show in a second when we um, get to the guest book. So let's go to about. Now I mentioned that in the app directory, it doesn't render anything unless there's a page special file. So in the pages directory, you would have page.tsx or about.tsx and that would be the literal name of the route. In the app directory, you have folders, you can have really whatever configuration you want. It's the page.tsx file that marks it as an addressable route. So I have an about folder and then I have page.tsx and that is what makes this route available for me to navigate to. So in here, again, I'm extending the default metadata and I'm saying I want about it's using the default uh, template here to add my name on the end. I render a basic static component. There is no data fetching. It's just some HTML and some styles and reusing some of the same components. Nothing too fancy here other than um, I'm using the native dark mode styling for Tailwind. So by prefixing styles with dark and then a colon, it allows me to style things to differently depending on what the system theme is. So if I uh, go into Raycast, I can toggle my system appearance, brace your eyes, <laughs> and I toggle to the system light theme, which changes the color scheme of my application. I'll toggle this back and go back to dark mode because dark mode is the best mode. I think we can all agree on that. And yeah, that's pretty much it and about. Nothing too special here. Let's go to the blog. Now some things are gonna to start to get interesting. We're gonna to start to talk about some of the more intricate parts of the application. So first up, we have the blog index page. We have the, the metadata again to extend the title and the description. We have an async component here, which actually I don't think needs to be async. I think that was a remnant of something I was doing in the past. So I could probably delete that. I'm code reviewing myself as well here too while I'm, while I'm going on this. Um, I get all the blogs, I sort them by the date they were published, and then I map over them and I render a next link. Next link will allow you to prefetch the routes on the screen so that the navigation is really fast when you click between them. And I render the title and then the view counter. Now there's something interesting here happening 
And it is one, I'm importing all blogs from content layer. Now this is some of the magic that content layer happens for me, uh, or that it handles for me, is that it will automatically generate all of my blog files or all of my content into this content layer folder. I have all the generated things here into data effectively, a JSON file here. And then I'm able to just import directly from this folder without needing to kind of hook, without needing to hook anything up myself. So I can import all blogs and I can access them here. And the nice thing is if I do A, I have access, this is fully typed, I have access to all the properties that I've defined on my content model. That's why I'm able to do published at, I'm able to see it's a string title, I'm able to see it's a string, etc. So that's super nice. Um, what else here? What else here is interesting? Uh, this view counter is interesting. Uh, that actually just made me remember why this is a async component. This view counter is a client component. And effectively what this is doing is it is, there's two different modes that this can run in. It can either run in the track view mode or it can run in the display mode. So in this instance, I'm just displaying all the views and I don't want to track any views. So when I reload the page, notice how there's this flicker essentially where initially I show nothing and I fetch the data from my API and I display it on the page. Now in this instance, I'm using SWR so that it has the revalidation when I navigate back. Um, that might change as we make improvements in the app directory. So stay tuned for that. But at least for now, uh, let me go back to here. I fetch all of the views. I'm just using a basic JSON fetcher. I filter by whatever the slug is that I'm looking at right now. Remember, this is being iterated over inside of this map. So I'm able to pass in the slug as a prop and track view equals false. I get the views based on the response from this API. And then I render out a paragraph. That's just rendering this text. If there's data, render the views to local string will actually put the comma in there for me. Or I just render a space here. Now let me pull up API views so you can see what this data actually looks like. So inside of pages API views, again, API routes will move to the app directory. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm fetching data from planet scale from my MySQL database. All I'm doing is essentially taking my query builder, I'm selecting from the views table, I'm grabbing just the slug and the count from that table, and then I'm running this statement, and then I return the JSON data. Now you might be wondering, what is this? What is this funky syntax that I'm looking at here and how does that work? Well, let's take a slight detour to talk about planet scale. So, Plan of Scale is a MySQL database. You could use whatever database you want, MySQL, Postgres, you could use Redis, it doesn't really matter. I'm using it here um, because I enjoy it and I like to try out new tech. Uh, and in particular, I'm using MySQL with uh, Keasley or Kaisley. I think it's Keasley, if I remember correctly. I need to double check the, the pronunciation of that. But what it does is it allows me to have a very lightweight ORM or query builder that's compatible with both serverless and edge compute. So it works on Vercel and other platforms. And it gives me time to save access to my data. So all it takes is I use the plan scale version. I pass in the database URL. I define what my tables are. I have a views table and I have a guestbook table and what the properties on those are. And then what that gives me is some really helpful stuff. So if I go back in here, let's say I did this. Now it says, hey, by the way, there is no table in your database called views D. So that's not gonna work. And then even if I was in here, if I typed this wrong, again, that's gonna blow up in my face. It's gonna give me the red squigglies. And it's gonna say, hey, that's not something that you can actually select from your table. So just a really simple way of getting type safe access to my data. Again, there's other ways of doing this. Quick plug for my blog post here, 
2023 state of databases for serverless and edge. Everything you've ever wanted to know about all of these different solutions. Uh, it's pretty long, but there's every single solution listed in here that I am aware of, or at least maybe not every single one, but there's there's quite a few listed there. Okay, let's go back to the view counter. Now, alternatively, I can pass in a prop to track a view, and this needs to happen on the client side because you wanna make sure the page actually loaded on the client side before I wanna track the view. So if I track the view, I'm going to hit an API and it's going to increment the view essentially. So I'll just pull that up as well here. It's very, very similar. I get the slug from the query. I construct a query here and I check, I uh, select from views where the slug matches. Uh, I'm gonna, this is the, the get. So I'm gonna get the views for this specific slug. If it's a post to this route, then I'm going to increment the count. And that's here and I'll return that new value. Otherwise, if it's just a get to this route, I'll just return the values back. Um, so that's how I have this set up here, which works decently well. For example, then if I navigate into, let's see, I'm at 8,540 here. If I click in uh, and I refresh the page, you're going to see that I have the new value here of 541. Um, so that's the view counter. It's a client component. If I go back to my page, I don't think there's anything else. Don't think there's anything else on the main root blog index route. So next, let's take a look at the individual blog posts. We talked about the main overview route, but then if I go into the slug folder using a dynamic route, I have another page. And in this page, I'm able to read the dynamic route. I'm able to read this route parameter here and get the param.slug. And then I'm going to be able to uh, find all my blogs and filter down to just the one for this slug. If I don't have a post, I'm going to use this not found function, which is going to take me to my 404 page. Uh, then I fetch all my tweets. So I've ex extracted out all the different tweet IDs from my post using that regex I talked about. And get tweets is a little helper function I have here. If I scroll up inside of this file, that is, it's kind of a hacky file, to be honest. Um, I would love to get rid of this in the future, but basically it is calling the Twitter API directly. It's doing some uh, massaging of the data to get it in a format that I like and then returning it back so that I have the tweets that I want to use. Okay, let's go into here. Now we get some interesting stuff. One, I'm using React Text Balancer. So I import this, or sorry, React Wrap Balancer. This is a amazing component created by Shu at Purcell. Uh, it allows you to automatically balance out your titles so that they never have like that weird overhang down on the next line. Uh, it's great. Super easy to use. You just wrap your text in it and it just works. Um, so definitely worth checking that out. I render when the post was published. I render the views. Again, I'm reusing the same exact view counter component that I did the last time. But in this instance, I am actually tracking the view. So slight, just a slight difference there. Uh, I have MDX. So this is a component where I pulled out the MDX rendering of my content. I take in, this is, this is from content layer. So I have the post. On the post from content layer, I can access the body and then get the actual code for the entire page. And this is my little addition here too, where I forward in all of the tweets. I see a comment, how are the views tracked? Yeah, I use Planet Scale for my database and I have this file here that effectively hits an API route to save the data to my database. It just uses a use effect to, to call it API route. So we're gonna talk about the MDX here in a second, but I also wanna show you that dynamic metadata that I talked about. So you saw the static metadata but you might've been thinking, well, what about stuff that is dependent on the URL? So in this instance, we have a generate met metadata function. So I'm able to, again, I can access all blogs. This is in the same file, 
filter by the slug. And then I can pull some information off of that blog post. I'm going to have an OG image that's using the Vercel OG package to dy dynamically generate OG images based on my content. And then I return a metadata object that looks, it's the exact same object as the static option, except it's fetched with dynamic data. Now Next.js is gonna merge all these together and the highest priority ones win. So again, the title, the description, the images, I've overwritten all of that with the latest stuff here, which means that, as you can see on the left here, actually, if I wanna pull this up, just so we can really take a look, I'll pull up the dev tools here. I'll expand the head of this document. And you see, I have not only things like the Google site, the Yandex verification, the robots, all the stuff that's from the initial layout metadata. But I also have the overwritten parts down below, which are the title of this blog post, the image for this blog post. It all, Next.js just handles all of that for me. Now there's something cool here, which is my, uh, my OG cards. It's a good time to talk about that. So I'm able to dynamically generate OG images on the fly depending on what my title of my blog post is. So for example, um, I could say sup stream. <laughs> and now I have a brand new OG card that has my title on here. I could even take this further if I wanted to. I could you know, change out the author name. In this instance, it's all me, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I can use this to really easily have to you know, generate all these different things without needing a bunch of different files. So I love that. Let's take a look at how that actually works. I don't think there's anything else that I wanna talk about in here. Okay, so I have an API route that I call OG, and that's the route that I'm actually hitting. And this is how it works. It's very, very cool, very, very cool. I see some mind blown <laughs> reactions in the chat. Yeah, I, I really, really love this. Uh, this is something that um, is, uh, it, it's something that we have a Vercel OG package for. It works with Next.js. It also works with other frameworks. Um, and we're wanting to like build it more into Next.js in the future. So let me just walk through here. I am using the edge runtime here, which is important. Um, you need to use the edge runtime for this. It just, it usually works better. You want your, um, you want your OG images to respond quickly so that when the service goes to actually hit that URL, it can pick it up very fast and show the image in like Slack or on Twitter and places. Uh, I am loading a custom font. So I'm loading that same Kaize font. And then I have an API route, it's a normal API route, um, but it uses the edge runtime. So I'm able to use the web APIs. For example, getting the search params, URL search params is a web API. I'm able to get the title. I fetch the font. And then this is the Vercel OG magic. It's really cool. You write JSX. You, you write like it's a React component. So I have an image response and I return a new div and I just do some styling here. Um, you can also use Tailwind for this. It's experimental, but it's kind of cool. In this instance, I just went with the normal inline styles. So I have a background image. I have um, my title, the post title, and then I set the width and height of the image and the fonts that I want to load. So 60 lines of code. That's all it takes to generate my dynamic OG images. Love that feature, super helpful. Definitely recommend checking it out. Um, what else? There's only one other thing in this blog file that I want to talk about, which is the dynamic routes. So as you recall, I have a dynamic route of slug here, which means that I need to generate all the different versions of my page. Now, this is an optional thing. As in the pages directory, you have uh, get static paths. When you want to generate static versions of a bunch of different pages, you used get static paths to figure out which ones you wanted to build during the build. Uh, and for the app directory, it's called generate static params. It's a little bit streamlined of an API, similar idea. But in this instance, I want all my blog posts to be static. I want to generate them during the build. So I'm iterating over all the blogs and I'm returning the slugs. I'm returning the slug because that is the value that is that matches one-to-one -one with the name of my dynamic param. So we've talked about the blog. We can close out of that chapter and let's go to the guestbook. Things get a little interesting here because now we're doing server rendering, which I'm very, very excited for. 
So let me pull up the code here. I have the page. Uh, in this instance, I did the data fetching for my page uh, actually in the file itself. You could abstract this out if you want. I just wanted to do it directly in here for the sake of putting everything in one file. That kind of comes down to a, a stylistic thing. So select from the guest book. Again, if this is messed up, I'm going to get the errors because it's going to say, by the way, that's not a valid table. Guest book, get the ID, body, created, updated, uh, order it for me, and then get the first 100. Uh, grab that data. This is just an async function. And then inside of my default exported React component for the page, I use an async function. Again, there's no serialization. There's no get static props, get server side props. You just mark it as async, and then you just fetch your data. That's it. That's all it takes to fetch data. There's nothing else that you need to do. Now, <laughs> in this one, I am doing it the quote unquote correct way by using all settled. <laughs> So I define two variables for the guestbook entries. And then for my session, I make two requests or two promises to get the data for the guestbook, which is what we just defined up top. And the cool thing about this too is because there's no serialization, I have type safety here, even on the return from this function. So for example, if I did, um, let's see, down here in entries, and it's not entries, I think it's somewhere. Somewhere else on here. Well, yeah, on the guestbook response, it's telling me the options that I have available from my database. So that's kind of nice. Anyways, um, so I'm using promise.all settled and I'm checking basically if the if the request was successful. If it was, I set the value. Otherwise, I log out an error. And by the end of this block, I now have the guestbook entries as well as if the user is logged in. Now let's talk about this. Get server session. This is a new improvement in next auth, now auth.js, that allows me to fetch the session inside of a server component. So I use this function. It used to be unstable, it's now stable. And then I pass, excuse me, then I pass in the auth options into this. And that allows me to, I'll just log out here for the demo. I have this uh, sign in with GitHub button. I click sign in. I've already off with GitHub here, so it's it's really quick and snappy, but that would pop up a, a modal or a, a, a new window that would allow me to log with GitHub and auth here. So that checks to see whether I'm logged in. So let's scroll down a little bit. Here is the actual content of the page. So guestbook, if there's a user, if the user is logged in, then I want to render the form as well as the sign out button. Otherwise render sign in, which you kind of just saw the demo of those two states. This is a server rendered page. Then take all the entries and render when it was created and what the what the person left in the guestbook. Now let's talk about the form and sign in and sign out. So this is all a server component. We're doing the data fetching. We're checking the auth entirely on the server, but there are pieces that require interactivity and we want those to be on the client. So there was another question too. Can I put my components deeper down into my folders in the app directory or do they have to be somewhere else? The answer is yes, you can co-locate these components directly next to my page, even though the only place I'm using these is inside of the page. So first up, I have actions. Uh, this is pretty simple. It's a client component and there's a button. So it's either sign in or sign out. And because it's interactive, because I have an on-click event handler, that's why it's marked as a client component. And next auth gives you these really helpful methods that allow you just to super quickly sign in sign out. Easy as that. So sign out, you click sign out, <laughs> sign in, you click sign in, but I specify that specifically in this instance, I've set up the GitHub provider here. That's that whole file. Form. In this instance, we are going to do a good old fashioned HTML form. Um, we are working on improved support for mutations in the app directory with the app router that will make this even easier, but at least for right now, it's still possible. So let's talk about how it works. One, I have a form that handles submitting. I have an input that has um, this name for the entry. I have a button that has type submit to submit the form. And I wanna disable that button if I'm actually making the request and changing the data. So I click on submit and it's going to call 
the on submit value. So let's scroll up a little bit here. I am going to say, hey, don't do the default where the page reloads, the default browser behavior for forums. I'm going to set some React state saying that I'm fetching. Grab the in input element for the entry, get the value, forward that to my guestbook. I'm just going to pass it in the body as a JSON object. And then I say, you know what? Well, I clear out the input. Look at this error handling. This is amazing error handling. <laughs> I get it back and I do nothing with it <laughs> because I haven't done that code yet. Uh, maybe I'll add that in the future. This is peak personal site where I've decided to skimp on the air handling. <laughs> uh, I say, okay, we're done fetching. And then I start a transition. So what we're doing here is we're using React transitions. We're refreshing the route and we're getting new data from the server. And we don't lose any of that client side state. So I do route a refresh, which is the essentially the workaround right now when we don't have built-in mutation support that allows you to go fetch that new data uh, and update the page. So uh, to demo here, I'll just say like, I'm showing this live on stream right now, coming soon to YouTube as well. Now, when I hit enter, it's going to actually call this on submit. The form will be disabled and it will also change the opacity so it's clear that it's disabled. I won't be able to spam the button because the button becomes disabled and it's gonna make this request. And then the data updates without losing any of my client side state or having to reload the page. And I see the new data shown here. So that's, that's all of the form. It's gonna get a lot simpler in the future. So I'm not too fixated on how it is right now, but that's the guest book. Let's move on to the users page. This one's easy. It's literally just HTML. Uh, it's it's just a list of stuff that I'm using. I've got some, some JSX, some HTML, and I'm using Tailwind typography again, like in the blog, which you use through this pros class name. Uh, and that's that's everything on this page. I also have metadata, which extends the root layout metadata as well too. What else? I've already talked about everything in app. Let's jump down to components. Um, I have Vercel Analytics, which allows me to track page use for my application. What I could actually do here is let me pull that up. I'll just give a quick little demo in case you want to see what this looks like. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, it's free right now in beta. It will have a free tier in the future if you want to check it out and you know replace Google Analytics or other similar tool. Let's see, last 24 hours. Uh, I'll go to here. So here's my Vercel analytics. Um, it seems like a bunch of people visited uh, 3 p.m., I guess. Let me go back. Last 30 days. A bunch of people visited on 10,000 on Monday, January 30th. So you have visitors, you have page views, and then I can actually we drill down here into like where they're coming from and who the referrers are and where people are visiting from. For sale analytics, it's great. I can also check web vitals as well too, um, which is pretty nice. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Let's talk about the MDX components that we have, and then I'll talk about the sidebar and the tweet as well too. So in the blog, essentially what I'm doing, if I'll scroll way down to the bottom here, is I have this component that takes all of the MDX components that I want to use. So I have a bunch defined in this file as well as the static tweet that I'm defining inline here because I passed in the tweets. So if you remember, I fetched my tweets on the server and I'm filtering them down here to find just the tweet with that ID. And then I use this tweet component. Um, but essentially all I'm doing here is I'm telling my MDX provider, I'm saying, Hey, when you go to render an H1, when you go to render an H2, when you go to render a code component, these are the components that you should use. So I have a few custom ones defined. I have a custom link that uses next link for those fast transitions. Uh, otherwise, it adds the rel no opener uh, target blank so that it opens in a new tag, a new tab. I wrap all my images in next image and I make them rounded with a class name. Uh, I talked about the call out a little bit, but it's a nice little call out component here. I have a pros and cons card, which is just, you know, 
something a little fun to add some checks uh, inside of here. And that's, yeah, that's, that's all the components I have other than the default styling that Tailwind Topography gives me. So nothing too, uh, nothing too extravagant here uh, other than the tweets, which I mentioned I fetch <laughs> the tweets from the API directly. I have a video on this on my YouTube channel if you want to learn more. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in depth, but basically I'm just building my own tweet component. So it's a bunch of uh, JSX and images that takes the data from the Twitter API and it actually uh, renders out a tweet. So for example, um, like this or like this with images or like this, you can handle uh, quote tweets as well too. Yeah, it works pretty well. So there's a video on my channel if you wanna learn more about that. Let's talk about the sidebar. I know there was questions on the sidebar. How do I get this animation, which is different if I'm on web or mobile? So I'm on kind of a mobile viewport here and it's a horizontal transition. So notice how it jumps between these. But if I'm on this viewport, it's vertical. How do I do that? How is that possible? Well, my sidebar component here is the client component, again, because of the interactivity, and it's using frame or motion. So what I did is I defined the different nav items, what their name is, what their X and Y position are, and what the width of the box that I want in the background is. So if I scroll down, I'll skip a little bit of this here. I'll go to the main export. I check for the path name. Use path name is a hook that's available in the app directory for client components. So you can look at the path. And I added this check so that any blog post will make the blog box active. If I scroll down a little bit, here's the magic. For all the different nav items that I defined in my array, given the path name, what I want to do is I have two different versions. I have the, let me make this a little bit bigger. If it's the def desktop version, it will be hidden on mobile. This is the one that animates the Y axis. So I have a motion.div, which uses frame or motion. And I set a couple different things. I set the initial X and Y positions. I say where I want to animate to. I want to change the opacity from zero to one. And I want to do that spring style animation to make it feel really fluid. So that's what you're seeing here when you navigate between these two. And I do the same thing, but for mobile, except I invert the positions because it's going to be a mobile, it's gonna be horizontal instead of vertical. Now you might be wondering, why do I have two of the exact same element uh, instead of just doing some kind of conditional? And that's because it's kind of hard to do a conditional rendering of this when it's a completely different orientation. Um, so what I did here that I find a good solution is that I just use CSS to hide the element um, on mobile or on desktop for the different div that I'm trying to show. I feel like that's easier than doing some kind of JavaScript to check whether I want to do uh, mobile or desktop or looking at the viewport width. Um, it just feels a little bit cleaner to me. Uh, then I also iterate over the nav items here and I use next link to do all the paths. And I also have the nice little um, active animations here as well too. It allows me to do the this when I hover over them. The only other thing to mention here is I also animate my my logo here. It uses motion.svg to animate the two different paths. So there's the L bar, the top bar, and then like the side bottom part. And I'm essentially just animating both the opacity and the length, changing their values just a little bit. So just small little touches that I, I like, uh, just to add a little bit of extra flair. I, I needed an excuse to play with frame motion, basically. And that landed me here with this sidebar. I'm, I'm pretty happy with where I landed. I think it's it's a decent compromise for where I'm at. Okay, we talked about app, components, content, library. Um, we haven't talked about library or pages yet. 
in depth. So library, we talked about Twitter, talked about plan of scale, metrics. This is the data that's being used on my homepage. All this is, is effectively a couple promises. And I am doing something really interesting here, which is I'm using cache. Now this cache function allows me to cache the result of my API such that if I make multiple requests to it, it's just gonna reuse the last one. So I'm fetching the data from my blog here and I'm accumulating the number of views and I'm wrapping it in cache. Now React also has built in fetch caching that's experimental right now, which means that if I am not doing something custom like a query builder here and I can use the web fetch API directly it will automatically cache this response for me, unless I specify otherwise using a cache control header. So for example, here I'm fetching uh, the tweet count. I return that. The result here from the fetch will be automatically cached by React. I don't have to do anything unless I want to change that to have ISR semantics or to have server rendering semantics. And I do the same thing with the star count. In this instance, I am using the GitHub Octokit API here to make that, or SDK to make that a little bit easier. Uh, there was a question, why do I return zero when the API token isn't set? Um, this is bas basically to make it easy for people who clone and deploy this, who maybe they don't have the Twitter API set up. I just don't want the build to fail if it's trying to, uh, you know, make a, make a request to something that's not legit. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, this is a typo. <laughs> this should be database URL. <laughs> and not Twitter API token. Again, that live code review, that live debugging really, really helps. <laughs> so thanks thanks for the call out here. Another cool thing you mentioned, import server only. What the heck is this thing? Well, this is effectively quote unquote poisoning. That's the, the technical wor word. Poisoning this file to say it can only ever run on the server. If you try to import this or use it anywhere on the client, it's gonna fail. This is really powerful because that means that you can very confidently know that you can use environment variables inside of here that have secrets and they're never going to be exposed to the client side. And you could package this up as a reusable library and make the API key a prop you pass in or an argument you pass in and be very confident that the contents of this library or of this file would only ever run on the server. Very, very powerful. I'm guessing we're going to see a ton of new abstractions built on top of this from companies building their SDKs, their um, ways to interact with their clients. So that's very cool. The only other thing to mention here is this setup script, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, actually, what I can do here, just for fun, what I will do is inside my package JSON, I have an NPM script of run setup. This is gonna run this node script that runs the setup script that I have. So let me do this and I'll just show you what I'm working with. So I have a public folder that has all the images from my blog. This is mostly uh, 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 just moving things over from the way they worked last time. I could co-locate co if I wanted to. I have images, I have this info about me in info. Let's say I wanna go in here and run the setup script. What's this gonna look like? Well, first off, it deleted all my images. Second, it deleted all of my blog posts inside of content and look at info. <laughs> so we have some, some placeholder info here now, your name, placeholder avatar. So if I actually start this up on my local dev server, I also have a placeholder blog post. So now, um, let's see. I have another application running on localhost 3000. Too many things running. 3001 is where this is at. So I see your name. I'm a developer. I have a placeholder avatar. I I have some end verse set, so it's able to fetch that stuff. If I go to blog, hello world, I see this brand new post. And that's pretty cool. That makes it really easy for me to get started and kind of delete all the all the stuff that I had included that was my own personal information makes it really easy for folks to kind of get up and running and get started with 
my repository. That wraps it up for taking a look at my code repository for lerob.io. The source code for this is available on GitHub. I'll link it in the description as well too. If you want to go check out the code, if you want to clone it and deploy it, I'll also leave a link to that as well. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in and see you in the next one. Peace.